Funding for Texas Monthly Talks is provided in part by Public Strategies Incorporated, managing campaigns for corporations around the clock and around the world. And J.P. Morgan Chase, the state's largest financial institution, serving large and small businesses, governments, schools, churches, and individual Texans just like you for more than 135 years. And the MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community. And also by the Matson McHale Foundation, in support of public television. I'm Evan Smith, the editor of Texas Monthly. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. If that sounds like a line from The Godfather, well, it is. But it's also the lesson of Doris Kearns Goodwin's acclaimed new biography of Abraham Lincoln, Team of Rivals. As Goodwin tells it, after winning the presidency, Lincoln decided to bring into his cabinet the smartest and most talented people he could find. And he looked no further than his challengers in the election of 1860. Adversaries all, but the best and the brightest of their day. Hard to imagine in an era when chief executives are more likely to be surrounded by yes-men and when politics routinely trumps policy that a room full of competing visions can produce results. But that foresight and selflessness was what made Lincoln Lincoln. And while we're talking about the best and the brightest, let us acknowledge that Goodwin herself is no slouch. A peerless historian, engaging storyteller, in-demand talking head, an elegant writer who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for No Ordinary Time, her biography of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. 62-year-old Goodwin, who has a Ph.D. in government from Harvard University, has also written best-selling biographies of LBJ, her one-time boss, and the Kennedys, along with a terrific memoir of her years growing up as a fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Of course, unlike Team of Rivals, none of those books was optioned by Steven Spielberg. Yes, coming soon... Liam Neeson as Honest Abe. A conversation with Doris Kearns Goodwin on this edition of Texas Monthly Talks. Doris Kearns Goodwin, hello. Hello to you. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted. It's great to see you. I want to ask you about why Lincoln is hot now. We have the Lincoln was gay book. We have the Lincoln was depressed book. We have, we have another big uh, Lincoln uh, book that's out right now, and it seems like all of a sudden everyone's arrived at the idea that Lincoln is a good person to write about. Why do you think that is? You know, it's interesting. At the turn of the 20th century, Ida Tarbell, the historian, said the reason there are so many books about Lincoln is because he's so companionable. Hmm. I think the reason he'll always be hot is that people love living with him. I mean, I spent 10 years with him. I could have spent another 10 years. Mm -hmm. Drill down at that a little bit more. Tell me what it is about him exactly that made him so appealing as a subject. Well, I think what made him so appealing to me was just that he has a remarkable vitality and life force that I hadn't fully understood until I got into it. His sense of humor is unbelievable. So I found myself laughing half the times at libraries. He's one of the most important presidents, but it's much more than that. It's his personal day-by-day -day ability to deal with people. At a time when politics is not at its most honorable, there was something about finding out that a person who could have the major resources of decency and morality and sensitivity and empathy, those could be great political resources if you use them right. So it made me feel more optimistic about everything. And, and even at a time when there was a lot of, what is the phrase this week, background noise going on in the White House, right? That was a very difficult time, particularly for him to be such a good politician. Oh, without a question. I mean, not only was the Civil War being fought on the outside, but because all, he put all of his rivals into his cabinet, there was like a civil war going on inside. inside. This is, of course, the central uh, basis for the book, T Team of Rivals is that uh, unlike a lot of politicians who only want people who say yes to them and tell them they're great, this president actually brought in all of his opponents. It's quite remarkable when you think about 
they got anything done, for one thing, right? Well, it was even unprecedented at the time because he was only a single-term congressman, two failed Senate right. races, and these guys were governors and senators and elder statesmen, so much better known than he was. Everyone assumed that he would just be a figurehead. Mm -hmm. But he said, the country's in a terrible situation. These are the strongest men in the country. I'm going to bring them in on my side. But he couldn't have imagined they would no longer be ambitious on their own, right? In fact, many of them continued to be ambitious against him. Oh, actually, the one, the one most amazing one is Chase, who'd been the governor and senator of Ohio, and he brings him into the cabinet, and he, unlike the others, never accepts Lincoln's primacy, and the two of them really don't get along very well. Chase says terrible things about him, is trying to mobilize the radical Republicans against him, tries to run against him in 1864, <laughs> but then the amazing thing that happens is, after Lincoln wins in 1864, a vacancy arises in the Supreme Court, chief justiceship, and everyone comes and gives him all sorts of other names, his friends, to put in there. Hmm. And he said, no, I'm going to put Chase in. I'd rather swallow a chair than to put him on the Supreme Court, but he'll be the best man for the rights of the emancipated slaves. And he was right. He was an abolitionist. He helped the slaves and the black man's rights afterwards. And that's an incredible contrast to today's world. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Uh, <laughs> but there, there's even a period at which, uh, if I'm remembering right, where before the election in 64, uh, Lincoln sends Chase to Ohio to actually help him. Well, you tell right. it. Right. I mean, tell it better. As Lincoln's worrying about his general election, after Chase is pulled out of the nomination race, he lets Chase go to Ohio, leave his Secretary of Treasuryship to, to actually stump for him in Ohio. But he knows that what Chase will really be doing is stumping for himself. But he figures if he can make us win, if he can help this cause, I don't care if he gets more popularity. He had the long view always, and mm -hmm. it, it turns out to make so much sense. You know, he was able to put past grudges behind because he said there's not time for personal contention. It, that's what I think was so pleasant for me about him. It just made you try and do better things in your own life as well. Talk about Seward and talk about some of the other principles so people know exactly who we're talking about. Well, Seward is, is my favorite character. He's like Churchill in a way. He drank a lot. He smoked a lot. He would have wear these pantaloons. He was a larger-than-life character. And he was definitely the one that they thought should have been the president. But the amazing thing is when Lincoln put him in as Secretary of State, he eventually recognized that Lincoln had a primacy over him. He said, he's the best of us. They became such great friends and allies. Lincoln loved nothing more than going to Seward's house at night, putting his legs up, and the two of them would just talk into the midnight. It's so interesting that you decided to focus on these people as opposed to on Lincoln. Although the book is obviously a book about Lincoln, you could have just focused on him. Well, but it would have been so much wrong. harder to just focus on him and have your own angle. Mm -hmm. You know, at first I thought maybe I'd try and do Mary and Abe Lincoln like I'd done Eleanor and Franklin. Right. But it turned out he was married more to these guys than he was to her because he spent so much time with them and so much emotional time waiting for telegrams to come in about the battlefront, relaxing at night, going to the front. And they're such great characters. And they all kept diaries, and they all wrote letters. I mean, they run the Civil War during the day, and they go home and write eight-page letters to their wives. Writing about a period of time so far back in our history, you really can only rely on things like letters. And you had access to an extraordinary amount of written material, right? No, the truth was that I was a little nervous about going back to the 19th century. But in this case, there's nothing quite as intimate and as honest and raw as people actually writing a letter to their wife or their daughter or keeping a diary. I mean, maybe sometimes they're thinking about the future, but when I read these things, they're mostly thinking about what's happening that day. Right. And there's nothing like an historian looking at a handwritten letter that somebody's written. You feel like you're by their side. I loved it. Was all, were all these letters at the Lincoln Library? No, you had to go various places. Seward's right. material was in Rochester, New York. Some of Stanton's was in Louisiana. Chases were in Philadelphia. A lot of it has been published, but the, the actual handwritten letters you had to go find library by library. And as you said, 10 years working on this book, over, over it, it was a 10-year period. Really yeah, it's on. embarrassing. I mean, twice as long as the Civil War. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but you can see when you have to go to Rochester and here and there to collect all this primary material, it's... It's a time-consuming process. Well, it was almost like doing a, a multiple biography because I really got into each one of these other people right. in order to give me some insight into Lincoln. Why did no one think to go this, uh, go down this path uh, as you did and, and go find these letters and use this as the basis for... You know, it's one of those things that once you do it, everybody said it seemed so obvious. Right. And I think maybe what happened to me is that I so enjoyed the colleagues around Roosevelt in mm -hmm. World War II, all of whom are on that second floor of the White House, Harry mm -hmm. Hopkins and, of course, Churchill and the various people that worked for him, that that seemed natural to me to surround him by people. But I think Lincoln's so big that most people just look at Lincoln alone. But in some ways, these guys are so big, it makes him even bigger if he's able to tame this extraordinary group.
back to the books I mentioned earlier, the Lincoln was gay book and the Lincoln was depressed book. Do you, do you read these other books as a historian or as a reader? Oh, absolutely. Do you and, you pass know, judgment on them? Well, you know, the interesting thing is the argument that Lincoln was gay is based on two sources. One is that he slept in the same bed with his best friend, Joshua Speed, and two, that he wrote affectionate letters to Joshua Speed. Well, when you look at the material that I was going through, it comparatively, it really helps. For They all slept in the same bed together. Privacy wasn't what we knew back then. When I looked at the letters my other guys wrote to each other, Stanton and Chase, for example, were friends in the 30s. When, when they were in their 30s, they'd both lost their wives, so they became very close friends. And at one point, Stanton writes to Chase saying, ever since our pleasant intercourse last summer, no one is in my mind more waking or sleeping than you are. I can't wait to sit by the fire, hold you by the hand, and say I love you. Right. Nobody, uh, nobody ever suggested that Stanton or Chase were gay. Seward had a great friend in the Albany State Legislature who wrote him at one point saying, I have positively womanish feelings towards you. So when you read and all still of nobody that, thought nobody thought it, nobody intercourse even imagined. and womanish were not no, tip -offs absolutely. people. <laughs> no, see, so what that suggests is that men could write each other more openly back then. I'm absolutely convinced that that's what it was. Men and women couldn't have friendships the way we can today because of the chaperoning of women. So men, men, and women, women had much more intense relations. Unless we assume they're all gay, I think the easier thing is to assume that at that time men were more free to express their feelings toward. Maybe you guys all feel that way. You just don't openly express it. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. Uh, uh, how, how about the depression? What about the depression aspect of the, well, the story that's being told? Yeah, I came away with a somewhat different feeling about this question of his depression. Granted, I do think he was born with a melancholy temperament. There's only one example of his having really had a terrible depression. When his first love, Anne Rutledge, died, he was very sad, rationally sad. There was one time, however, when three things came together. Joshua Speed was leaving town, Mary Todd Lincoln and he had broken their engagement, and his political career was going downhill, he thought. And he was, at that time, his friends worried suicidal. They took knives and razors from his room, and one of them went to him, Joshua Speed, and said, you know, Lincoln, unless you rally, you will die. And he said, well, I would just as soon die, but then the amazing thing he said is, but I haven't done anything yet to be remembered by. He was haunted by the idea that when you die, you're just dust, and, and that's it. So he wanted to have somebody remember him afterwards. And the amazing thing is once he recovered from that depression, that desire to accomplish something worthy carried him through two lost Senate races, the early days of the Civil War, until finally when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, Joshua Speed came back to the White House, and, and they remembered this conversation when they were both much younger, and Lincoln said, well, maybe at last my fondest dream has been realized. There is no evidence during those terrible years of the war mm -hmm. he ever was dysfunctional, fell into depression. Once he was there with that challenge in front of him and his talents being exercised, I'm convinced that he sustained the spirits of everyone else rather than the other way around. How, how do historians disagree like that? Because the, the author of this book is a, a writer, young guy, but a smart guy, right, right. who has spent an awful lot of time constructing this case based on presumably material that he believes in. And you come away from it d differently. I just wonder how you... Well, I think part of it is the way one defines what's melancholy and what's depression. I mean, clearly, I think part of his thesis is correct, that there was some benefit to the idea that he was able to, he understood his melancholy, mm -hmm. and he figured out ways to help himself out of his sad moods. And that I agree with totally. For example, every lost battle, he would immediately go to the battlefront to see the soldiers. When he was feeling like he was overworked, he would go to the theater. And obviously, humor was an enormous source. He once said that he laughed so he didn't cry, and that a good story was better than a drop of whiskey. So I found that what it was, it wasn't that he didn't have this underlying sadness. It was that he had enormous resources to figure out how to get out of them, and those resources turned out to be incredibly productive for him as a leader. Let's stay with Lincoln and his own view of himself and others' views of him and put him in the context of the many presidents that you've written about. You've done books about uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. You've now done Lincoln, and of course you have watched as an observer and as a commentator George W. Bush. Talk about Lincoln in that spectrum. Well, when I think about the comparison between Lincoln and LBJ, I guess the thing that comes most to mind is they were both great storytellers. I mean, one of the things that I will never forget are the years when I was a young girl here and listening to Johnson tell me stories about the past. I mean, he could mimic. He was larger than life. They were colorful. I mean, there was a problem with these stories sometimes that they, half of them weren't true, but they were great nonetheless. <laughs> so Lincoln developed his reputation 
as a young pol politician by standing by a fire when he was a lawyer, and people would come from miles around to listen to him tell stories, and I believe that was true of Lyndon Johnson as well. When I think of the comparisons with Franklin Roosevelt, there's something intuitive about a great leader who understands the mood of the country and when to educate and shape opinion. Just as Roosevelt understood that we had to move step by step toward a greater involvement in the war in Europe, even before Pearl Harbor, right. um, John, so, so Lincoln understood with the Emancipation Proclamation that he had to move step by step until the timing was right. And that's the mystery of great leadership, to feel the country intuitively. They both, I think, were able to do that. I think with Kennedy, the thing that strikes me is that one of the things Kennedy did after the Bay of Pigs immediately was to acknowledge error and acknowledge that it was his fault and take the blame for that. And Lincoln did that time and again. He shouldered responsibility for failures, and that's a great political tool. Well, I'm inclined on the basis of all of that, but especially the last part about Kennedy, to ask about Lincoln and Bush, what Lincoln would have made of Bush and Bush's approach to the presidency, where the president is said to at least be in a bubble and not have a lot of conflicting accounts of the world around him. The I mean, fact that you don't bring your rivals in, you bring your friends in, means you're even more cut off from the country at large because the White House today is so much more insulated than it was in, in Lincoln's time. Mm -hmm. So you better bring those outside sources in because otherwise it's such a cocoon there now. In the old days, in, in Lincoln's time, 8,000 people would come in on New Year's Day and shake his hand. And they could be backwoodsmen, diplomats, anybody Good could man. come in. And as a result, people said, why are you wasting time? This is not, you don't have time for this. And he said, it's my public opinion bath. I'd like to remember the popular assemblage from which I've come. I think the modern presidents, and I think Mr. Bush is an example, have lost that touch. I mean, what strikes me so about Mr. Bush is that when he started, that whole idea of compassionate conservatism seemed to suggest that he could see both sides of an issue, both sides of, of, of way people felt. But he's governed in a much more narrow way. And then the White House exacerbates that. Having your friends around you exacerbates that. Right. So I think that produces the trouble that he's in. And even the idea of having these town hall meetings out on the road, in the case of this president, but screening the people who are coming to the exactly. meetings, it really insulates you from any point of view other than yours. Because what you've got to hope is that you, you grow when you're in that White House. I mean, Lincoln was a much better leader by 1863 and 64 than he was in 61, because you've got to learn on the job. But the only way you can learn on the job is you acknowledge when you're wrong and you figure out what mistakes you make and you don't make them again. But if you can't acknowledge them, then you can't grow. That's the problem. It's not just that the country wants you to acknowledge it and that it's good for the press to say you made wrong. It's good for yourself to figure out what was wrong. Mm. Uh, let me back away from this book and of Lincoln and just talk about being a historian. It seems like it's great to be a historian now. You know, historians are, are celebrated, big books. You know, you have at the national level the David McCulls of the world. Here in Texas we have H.W. Brands. We have people writing about big subjects and the books are always, you know, you can't put them down. And I, it's hard to imagine that historians would be hip. <laughs> but, um, but here you go. No, you know, it's a wonderful thing actually because I think what's happened is that because of television, interestingly, mm -hmm. and the chance that you have when an event takes place, like for example in the year 2000 when I would be doing coverage of the 2000 election, where else could you be on television talking about Rutherford B. Hayes or John Quincy Adams? Right. And the country will care because there's echoes of the past that have some relevance to the present. I think it's great. I love histories. I've loved histories since the days when my father taught me that art of keeping score of baseball so I could record for him the history of that afternoon's Brooklyn Dodger game. That's history, too. So for too. me, yeah. that's history, too. Is, is there a balance that you have to be careful about striking between the scholarship on the one hand and something more popular on the other hand? Because it seems to me that you can veer over into a lot less scholarly pursuits in the name of making a name for yourself. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that all depends on the research. I mean, one of the reasons why this book took so long was because of the research, which is the part I love the most. Right. So I think that's right. You have to figure out where you're, you're going to be sure to get in new original information, and at the same time, hopefully if you can write narratively, right. then you can still have that depth of understanding. And there are something like 100 pages of source notes in this book about Lincoln, which is extraordinary. Well, the primary materials were so rich, and the great thing about doing a book on Lincoln, there's a community of Lincoln scholars out there. I was a rookie coming into this field. They were so generous and so open, and it was through their helping me with sources, so now I've uncovered some new sources, so I want them to have them as well. Yeah. Uh, let me look back on uh, a couple of years ago the controversy over the Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys mentioning the source notes and the, there were accusations made at the time that you had not been as careful with giving credit to a source as possible. 
Can you talk about that period and how difficult, as a historian in particular, it was to uh, have to I'd combat be, that? I'd be glad to. First yeah. of all, the important thing to remember is that the actual thing took place nearly 20 years ago. Right. The book I mean, was the published, book was in, 1987. published in 1987. Right. As soon as the problem, and the problem was not that I didn't credit the source, but some of the, the quote marks were not in the right places. The source was credited. As right. soon as it was brought to my attention, I corrected it in a subsequent edition, and completely to her satisfaction. And then this it was, is the person who was identified as the exactly, original source of the material. Exactly right. so. And so when it was brought out again three years ago in the context of some other problems with historians, I acknowledged it again. And that's it. I mean, there's nothing more you can do than to say you made a mistake some time ago. A whole group of historians wrote a letter to the New York Times saying it was obviously unintentional. When you give the source there, how in the world could you not be wanting to credit them? So I've just made sure this time everything is checked and double-checked. Does it bother you to have this be something people ask about? I mean, I'm sure it, it, you'd rather be talking about Lincoln, but uh, you make you know, a mistake like that or at least one, an accusation is made and it fo- has, tends to follow you around. You know, you get used to it after a while. Yeah. I mean, it, I realize when I go places and there's a lot of people that have come to see me. I mean, it's never come up in the last three years until now. I mean, it's, right. it only comes up with journalists. Right. So I, it's, it's part of... You know, part of the, being a public lead, a public person, there's great benefits to it. People will get your books. They're glad to see you. And I so, am, I so value that. So the other side of being a public figure is that these, these things, if I, if I were never known, nobody would have talked about it. But I'm just hoping that this book answers those problems to because some, I'm to very some degree, proud of it. The thing we talked about earlier about you being on television a lot and the hipness of historians, you know, you, there are probably groupies, you know, people who see you and... You know, within your world, you're kind of a rock star. And it probably the attention, the attention on you is that much greater as a result of how famous you are. And I'm, I'm willing to take that price then it's, for it's, it. It's yes. a price as long as I know that I did what was necessary in correcting it, that I acknowledged it when it happened nearly 20 years ago, right. and it's over. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's spend a little bit of time before the end here talking about a more important subject even than Lincoln, and that's baseball. Yes, sir. Because I know uh, you are one of the great, your first uh, woman to enter the Red Sox locker room. Is it that is correct? true. I have certain questions I'll ask you privately about that, um, <laughs> but publicly, publicly, let me let me ask you: What uh, is the origin of your interest in baseball, and what sustains that interest even this many years? Well, ago? it definitely began with my father. I was the third girl in the family, and he loved baseball, having come from Brooklyn. So when I was six years old, he taught me that wonderful, mysterious art of keeping score. And so I would sit at home in the afternoon, record every single play of every inning of the game that had taken place, and then he would listen to me for two hours every night. So it makes you think there's something magic about history and the combination of baseball. And then what happened is, because I was on Ken Burns' documentary on the history of baseball, I never thought about writing a memoir about it, but I was going out to talk about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and everywhere I went, people said to me, oh, I had a similar relationship with my father, or I love baseball, or I remember the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so I ended up writing a memoir about growing up right. in love with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And it meant a lot more to me than I thought it would, because my parents died when I was young. My mother died when I was only 15, and my father died when I was still in my 20s. So I think part of the love of baseball that still exists and is irrational, I'm now a season ticket holder of the Red Sox, and I think about them 162 days a year. It's ridiculous. I could be writing a lot more books. But I think what what happens is, you know, I have three sons now. They've all become baseball fans. You know, and I can go to um, Fenway Park and imagine myself with my father again. And somehow when we're sitting there, I can picture the old players of my youth and I've told so many stories to my kids about my father because they never got to know no, him. Right, yeah. So that I think it's got very much to do with father-daughter stuff, and I'm very glad that baseball has been that connecting link. What happened to the Red Sox this year? We just didn't have the pitching. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, and the weird thing is I w- I'm okay. You know, if it had been yet enough. <laughs> if it had you want to take a minute? Do you want to <laughs> If it had been yet another year of another loss, you know, then we would have thought, oh, my God, we really are cursed. But that victory last year, I think, will last us for quite a while, although I thought I would never really care again, and I certainly did want to win, and I wanted a dynasty. I began to feel like a Yankee fan. Don't be greedy. <laughs> exactly. Right. doesn't help the Yankee fans either. No, exactly. Uh, let's talk about what you're working on next. I can't, I can't, it's hard to ma- imagine that you're going to work on anything next. This took 10 years, right? But you still got to... Well, you know, the hard thing for me right now is to figure out whether I can get out of this period because I've loved it so much. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to try and find another subject back in it. But I'm not sure whether that's just because I'm still feeling so loyal to Lincoln that it would be bad to leave him. When I left Roosevelt to go to Lincoln, I felt like I was betraying him a little bit when I had mm-hmm. to move all my Roosevelt books out of my study and bring in the Lincoln books. 
In fact, I have this abiding fear someday that there'll be a panel in the afterlife of all the presidents I've written about, and yeah. each one will be telling me everything I got wrong, and the first person will speak up will be Lyndon Johnson, and he'll be saying, how come that book on the Kennedys was twice as long as the book he wrote about me? You obviously know him well. <laughs> well, well, seriously, what are you? I'm going to make you at least well, give a little I'll bit Well, I'll tell you, away. I've been thinking a little bit about the fact that there was a certain benefit of looking about these people together and contrasting them comparatively with Lincoln hmm. to give me an insight into Lincoln. So I might look at the generals that surrounded him hmm. and do a multiple look at McClellan as such an incredible character. Oh, my God, writing these letters to his wife saying that he feels like God has placed him where he is and that he should be a dictator and how terrible Lincoln is. And Grant is such an interesting figure and some of the generals in between. So... I'm going to at least start reading and see whether that's possible. And do you expect that you'd take as long, potentially, on that book? Well, I don't one? think so, because I think I figured out a little bit how to do the multiple biography stuff. Right. And also, I did write the memoir in between these 10 years. So, And there was also a ton of television because of all that's been going on between Clinton and the year 2000, so that if I can just keep myself on the path of writing, perhaps maybe it'll be a little better. And you're not retiring from television? No, no, I love doing it. Well, you know, the great thing is you do have a chance to say something and have it over with. I mean, instead of a book that's going to take 10 years, if you have a thought in your mind, it's out there and you go home and it's done. That's right. Well, it's been fun to see you and fun oh, to meet you thank and talk you to so you. Much. Appreciate you being here. Uh, uh, come back again. I promise. It's thank a you, deal. Doris Kurtz. Thank Good you. Win. Thank you. Funding for Texas Monthly Talks is provided in part by Public Strategies Incorporated, managing campaigns for corporations around the clock and around the world. And J.P. Morgan Chase, the state's largest financial institution, serving large and small businesses, governments, schools, churches, and individual Texans just like you for more than 135 years. And the MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community. And also by the Matson McHale Foundation in support of public television.